Chapter 5 A couple of days later, Dr. Hemond held a final meeting with Michael and Anne. The swelling around the tumor site has gone down. Michael's headaches have decreased dramatically, and there was no dizziness this morning. Dr. Hemond checked his notes. From the scans and your blood work, everything looks good. I'm going to ask you not to engage in any vigorous exercise for the next two weeks. Rest when you are tired. You are not allowed to drive or operate any heavy machinery. You are on vacation, no working. If the headaches come back and do not improve with the prescription I am giving you for within four hours, I want you to call my office. If the dizziness returns, call my office. If the office isn't open, come into the hospital. If you experience stroke symptoms or have any seizure, call 911 immediately. You are doing extremely well, Michael. Most people would not be recovering as quickly as you. I'm very pleased by your progress. We'll set up an appointment for Womb to take out the stitches. He signed a form. I'm releasing you into Anne's care. Michael breathed a sigh of relief. He could go home. Anne was given another stack of forms and papers detailing appointments, the prescriptions, and what signs to look for if something went wrong. She added it to the collection in her purse to sort out and organize later. Dr. Hemond shook both their hands and then left the room. They collected up their possessions from the hospital room. It didn't take long. Michael gave the room one last look, and then they were greeted at the nursing station by the many nurses who had helped during his care. Kelly came forward and gave him a hug. "'We heard you were leaving us.' Michael gave her a nod, and she hugged Anne as well. "'I think we'll be happy to go home,' Anne offered. "'Thank you for everything you've done for us.' Kelly smiled. "'He was an easy patient. All the nurses got together, and we signed a card for you, Michael, so that you'll remember us. You can have it right after you sign your discharge papers.' She handed him the pen and clipboard. Without thinking about it, he started to write his name, but then the letters became difficult and confusing. He hesitated over them, then simply scrawled something unintelligible. He wouldn't be able to read the card. However, he could appreciate the sentiment behind it, he decided. Everyone congratulated him on his recovery, and finally he and Anne were able to leave. It was a relief to climb into the back of the car, a private driver waiting on them. He could sit beside Anne. The trouble began when he realized they were driving toward the condo. No, he said. He was surprised at his voice. It felt rusty. He cleared his throat. Anne looked at him in confusion. What is it? No, he repeated calmly. He pointed to the road ahead. Michael, it's okay. We'll go back to the condo and get you settled in, Anne said, trying to comfort him. He shook his head. He didn't want to go back to the condo. He had been looking forward to going to the beach house. That was where he wanted to go. He could take walks at the beach house. He could see and smell the ocean, listen to the sound of it from his room. He could fish off the pier if he found his old rod back. He could sit in his sailboat, even if he couldn't sail it. He could listen to his housekeeper, Fen Lee, chatter as she worked. It would be better than sitting in the condo downtown doing nothing. He wanted the beach. I don't understand. Anne was upset. What do you want? He grimaced, then motioned for her pen and the day planner that she kept toting around. He couldn't do the words, but perhaps a picture. He turned to the back of the book and began with clear strokes of the pen. There was the house, the deck, the sand, the waves, the sun and the sky. He even put a boat in the water for effect. Anne's eyes were clouded in confusion. A boat? He motioned for her to try to keep guessing. I don't get it. You're not going on a boat. Michael sighed, then handed back the planner and pen. She studied the picture some more. Why would you draw this? Because I want to go there, he thought. He reached into his overnight bag for his house key to the condo. Right there, beside the key, was another one. The one to the beach house. He turned to Anne and held up the key ring. She stared at them, then looked at him. He held up the key to the beamer. "'That's your car key,' she said, wondering what he was driving at. He nodded. He held up the condo key. "'The key to the door of the condo?' she guessed. He nodded again. "'Please let her understand this.' He showed her another key. "'The key to your office.' She grabbed the key ring from him. "'Your safe, your desk.' There was one more key left. The beach house key. 
She looked at it, trying to remember what other property he might have since it was obviously a house key. The beach house, she guessed. You want to go to the beach house? He nodded, pleased that she finally understood. Michael, are you sure that's wise? The condo is much closer to the hospital. If anything goes wrong, she looked at him with worry. He was willing to take that risk. He gently took the key and held it up. She wavered indecisively. I don't think it's a good idea. We should stay near the hospital. Michael took both her hands in his and held them up between them. He silently pleaded with her until she sighed. He smiled. She informed the driver of the new address, and they were on their way. Michael leaned back and kept hold of one of Anne's hands. He contentedly watched the city go by. It took an hour to reach the beach house. Michael could feel his tension go away. The ocean had always helped him to relax. He didn't even wait for the driver to open his door, but got out and lent a hand to help Anne out. She looked up the large three-story home on prime beachside property, and he realized this was the first time she had been there. She'd never been to his condo either, even though he'd been to her apartment to escort her to various business functions that the company required his presence at. Wow, Anne said. It was beautiful. She had no idea that he owned such a property. Well, she'd known he had a house on the beach, but she hadn't thought it was this large or in a Cape Cod style. She thought it would be glass and maybe two stories. She loved it instantly. From the front she could see that the backyard was the beach, just sand leading to the ocean. She knew that it had been David and Rachel Ramsley's vacation home for years before Michael bought it from them. He went to the house on the weekends when he wasn't working, which had become fewer and fewer as the years went by. She could see why he wanted to be here. She just hoped the distance from the hospital wasn't going to impact his health should anything go wrong. He took her by the hand and pulled her up the walk to the front door. It was obvious he was happy, and so she shoved her worries away, letting him show off the house to her. He was proud of the place. Everything was beautiful, up to date. The kitchen was marvelous, huge with a breakfast bar and all the brand new appliances anyone could want. The living room, one of two, faced the water. The next one had a fireplace and an enormous television with cushy leather recliners. There was a study full of books and an old scarred desk, and a sea chest that looked at least a hundred years old. There were throw blankets on beautiful armchairs. The guest rooms each had their own spa bath. The master was simply huge with a walk-in closet that was nearly the size of her own bedroom in her apartment. There was both a spa bathtub and a large glass shower in the bathroom. There was a rec room with a pool table and a small bar. At the back of the house, each floor had sliding doors looking out to the water. There was a structured deck for the second and third floors. It was amazing. They stood on the deck and watched the waves gently push at the sand. Gulls soared over their heads. Michael put his hands on her shoulders and watched the ever-changing waters. He felt entirely at peace. He was home. Anne was here. They managed a light dinner before Michael began to tire. Anne told him to go to bed and that she would take care of the dishes. However, he pulled her away from the sink with a firm shake of his head to the negative. The housekeeper, Fen Lee, would take care of the dishes. Not that he could tell her that. He shut off the lights to the kitchen and climbed the stairs to the next floor. He was still in his comfortable sweats, so he really didn't see any reason to change. He pulled back the covers to his bed and sat yawning. He was wiped. Anne hovered in the doorway. She came over and took his hat off, laying it on the night table. "'Your hair is growing back,' she commented, softly touching it. Good. He had no liking for the bald him. Plus, it would cover the scar eventually. "'You know, I forgot to pack pajamas,' she said wryly. "'I didn't really think about staying overnight, since I hadn't expected you to get discharged so soon.' Technically, she didn't have to stay overnight. She had insisted since she was worried about him. He liked that she would be there. He didn't want to admit that he was a little worried, too, that if something went wrong there would be no one here to help him until Fen Lee came in the morning. Michael motioned to the closet. He had plenty of clothes. If she wanted to, she could borrow. What? He repeated the gesture. I don't understand. She was confused. He stood and went to the closet. He pulled out a tea and held it up against her. It was too big for her, but maybe to sleep in? Kind of like a nightgown? 
Can I borrow it? she asked. He nodded. It was one of his Harvard shirts. He had the feeling she'd look amazing in it. Then again, he thought she looked beautiful in everything. She took the shirt. Thank you. He nodded, then endured her nearly tucking him in. Really, she was fussing too much, he thought tiredly. She checked on him three times that night that he was aware of. It was ridiculous. There was no way she was going to get any sleep when she kept tiptoeing over to his room to see if he was still alive. He wasn't going to get any sleep either, waiting for her to come back each time. On the third time, he reached out and tugged on the shirt that he had lent her. She had a pair of shorts on with it, and while he'd never seen her look so casual, he liked it. "'Michael, you should be sleeping,' she admonished. He had probably scared her. However, there was no sleeping when she was sneaking around. He steadily tugged on her shirt until she was sitting on the bed. "'Okay, what would you like? Can I get you something? A glass of water?' She could get him a full night's rest. He moved over, then patted the bed. It was king-sized. There was plenty of room for both of them. "'Michael, I'm not going to sleep here,' Anne said. He sighed. Then neither of them were going to sleep." patted the bed again and took her hand so that she couldn't leave. Well, maybe just until you go back to sleep? Anne got comfortable. Michael smiled and closed his eyes. When he opened them in the morning, it was a beautiful sunrise. The rays of the sun were cascading across the room, but the most beautiful sight was in bed with him, cuddled up to him. He gently stroked her silky hair for a few minutes, watching her. He could hear Fen Lee starting coffee downstairs. Regretfully, he disengaged himself from Anne. He got changed into clean sweats and grabbed his hat on the way quietly out of the room. He came down to the kitchen and got himself a cup of coffee. Fen Lee stared at him. What? You think you're some gangster? Start rap club? He smiled despite himself. He supposed he looked like a bum with the hat and the beard. He should shave. He gave the little Vietnamese woman a one-armed hug. She pushed him away. Go away! Drink coffee. I start clean kitchen, must finish. Make breakfast after. Shoo! Michael followed her suggestion, settling himself on a deck chair watching the waves in the sun. Life was good. Anne yawned. It must be nearly eight in the morning. She had slept in and Michael was already up. She blamed the stress of everything that had happened since Michael's surgery. Grabbing Michael's robe from the bathroom, she padded her way to the kitchen, but was surprised to see a small woman humming and scrubbing the counters. Hello? The tiny woman stopped. She must be just under five feet in height. She was dark in color and of undeterminable age. She stared at Anne. My goodness! He finally bring woman home. I'm beginning to worry he always be a bachelor. Anne blinked. You pretty! Come closer, I make coffee. You want some? She peeled off her rubber gloves and grabbed a cup out of the cupboard. She used a step stool to reach the bottom shelf. Anne wondered what she did when she wanted something off the top shelves. Um, yes, please? Anne sat down on a stool at the breakfast bar. My name is Anne. You are... Fenley. I cook, clean, run errand. Take care of house and Mr. Michael when he here. She put down a cup of coffee in front of Anne. Cream? Sugar? Please. Anne watched as the efficient little woman grabbed the requested items. How long have you worked for Michael? Ten year. Fen Lee gave Anne the sugar and cream. She leaned forward conspiratorially. Tell me, Mr. Michael good in bed? Anne stared at her in shock and blushed furiously. Ooh, blushy, blushy. Fen Lee wiggled a finger. I thought so. We didn't, we aren't romantically involved, Anne said flustered by the housekeeper's insinuation. What? No sex? Fen Lee gave her an unbelieving look. He big man, you pretty lady. No, Anne said firmly. Michael had an operation. I'm here to help take care of him. Fen Lee harumped. What sort of operation? Take appendix? No, he had a couple of tumors removed from his brain. He okay? The little lady turned serious. He's okay. He's just... Anne sighed and then explained about the speech aphasia. So he no talk no more, Fenley asked. Anne nodded. Not much, no. He no gonna call me bossy no more? 
Fen Li looked upset. He calls you bossy? Anne asked, surprised. All the time. It okay. Mr. Michael don't mind my bossy. Fen Li resumed wiping the countertop. If he no like, he would have fired me many years ago. You want breakfast? Anne struggled to keep up with the conversation. Okay? I make eggs and bacon. Brown toast. How you like egg? Scrambled, please. Anne looked around. Is Michael up already? He take coffee and sit on deck. I make him breakfast, too, as soon as I finish kitchen. No car in driveway. I not know he here. Good thing I have grocery and car for me. Are we eating your groceries? Fenley, you shouldn't give us your groceries. Why not? I'd buy more. I buy grocery for Mr. Michael all time. She put away the gloves and grabbed out a couple of pans. Give ten minutes. Breakfast ready. Thank you, Fenley, Anne said, but the little woman waved her away. Anne took her coffee and went to the deck to find Michael sitting in one of the deck chairs sipping from a mug, the knit hat still camouflaging the bandage. He smiled at her, and she couldn't help the tenderness that flowed through her. She sat next to him. Have you been up for long? He shrugged. I met your housekeeper. He looked at her expectantly. She says you call her bossy. Anne lifted an eyebrow. Michael gave a guilty but amused nod with a bit of a shrug. I like her. Anne turned her attention to the water. It was very calming. She could sit out here every morning with a coffee in good weather. Did she show up one day and refuse to go away, kind of like I did? Michael had a snort. Anne turned to look at him. She did, didn't she? He smiled and nodded. What did she say, that she had eight children to feed and so you couldn't turn her away? He held up five fingers. Oh, only five. I'm disappointed. Anne sipped her coffee. I still like her. And since the house is sparkling, I suppose she earns whatever you pay her. He nodded. Any headache this morning? He indicated no. Dizziness? Again, no. Good. Anne was relieved. A moment later, Fenley was at the door. Ten minute up. Breakfast ready. She waved a spatula at Michael. Now, Mr. Michael, why you two share bed? I look. Guest room not used. Missy Anne say no sets, but I wonder. Anne felt her face turn red even as Michael got a little ruddy. He rolled his eyes at the little woman and shook his head. You have sex, you marry her. I, good Christian woman, no work for bad men, she winked at Anne. I make some coffee cake for you. Eat later. Anne sputtered. Fen Lee? What? No like cake? she said innocently. Yes to the cake, no to the sex. I stayed to be sure he was okay. I'll be moving to the guest room today. Anne was embarrassed. Okay, Fen Lee said doubtfully as she dished up breakfast and poured refills in the coffee. She then grabbed the vacuum and humming went to vacuum downstairs. Anne put her head in her hands. Michael ate a piece of bacon and watched her. She composed herself and started eating breakfast. I think you're right. She is bossy and nosy, Anne said. He smiled. Michael stared at the paper in frustration. He wanted to throw the pen across the room. Instead, he set it down carefully, like it was a poisonous thing on the desk. He'd started by trying to script out the alphabet. He had beautiful cursive, but that didn't matter when it didn't loop as it should, when letters went backwards, sideways, and not in the right spot. He tried small words. Dog, cat, bird. What stared back at him was gibberish. He closed the journal, blocking the offending page. It all confirmed what he already knew. He rubbed his eyes. He now had a study that was entirely useless to him. Forty-two volumes of journals he had kept since he was eight sat on the shelves with all the other books, mocking him. Michael? Anne came in with his medication and a glass of water. She set it down on the desk. Are you okay? He nodded, as okay as he was going to be. She gently took the book from under his hand and flipped through it. He came to rest on his latest endeavor. Oh, Michael. He shrugged and took the medication. His head was beginning to hurt, but he suspected that it was from the stress of not being able to put his thoughts to paper. She flipped through the book and paused, reading, Is this poetry? He stood and gently took the book from her. 
The last thing he wanted was for her to read his many, many odes to her. They were boyish ridiculousness. He placed the book on the shelf with the others. You must have forty books here. Did you write them all? Anne asked, trailing a hand over them. Michael nodded. Forty-two. There would be no forty-three. Is it all poetry? Michael shook his head no. He was tired. He didn't want to even look at them ever again. They only reminded him of what he had lost. Michael turned and left the room. His head did hurt. He was going to take a nap. Anne followed him, hovering until she realized that he was going to lie down. She pulled the blinds, dimming the room, and let him mercifully be. Anne wondered if he had a headache, or if he was just depressed at the failure of his efforts. He had known he wouldn't be able to write, but he had tried anyways. Her heart ached for him. Drawn back to the study, she picked out a volume at random from the row of journals. Each were leather-bound vellum, two inches thick. They were beautiful books, filled with Michael's beautiful script. Opening it to the beginning, she sat in one of the comfortable armchairs by the window and began to read. It was a story, a children's story full of creatures from the beach and ocean. Words were crossed out, rewritten, and circled. A few pages later, the story started again. This time, it was a perfect draft of the other story, copied painstakingly from the earlier draft. There were pictures of the creatures and of their adventure. Anne enjoyed it immensely. She couldn't believe that Michael had written such a thing. He was always so serious, and here was an amusing story of imagination. How many times had she seen him writing at his desk during the early afternoon, and she had thought it was likely to do with the many legal issues the company dealt with? Michael had deceived them all. He was a writer at heart. And now he could no longer practice his craft. It was incredibly sad. She skipped a couple of pages and skimmed through journal entries about business at the company. This journal was old. The date put it a few months after she had been hired. She wondered what he had thought of her back then. She flipped through to find an entry with her name. There she was. The memory was as detailed as if it had happened yesterday, and she remembered it. He'd asked her for a specific document that he needed for the afternoon meeting. She remembered having it on her desk, but after a search she hadn't found it. She had begun a mad scramble to try to find it. The old secretary had left, and it was now her job to know these things, to be organized and ready. Yet she couldn't find the file. She'd panicked and gone through everything again. She'd made a complete mess out of what was on the desk, in the desk. She was in the middle of the file cabinets when Michael had asked her for the document because the meeting was going to start in fifteen minutes, and he wanted to brush up on a particular clause. She must have looked absolutely horrified because he'd knelt beside her and asked what was wrong. She admitted to misplacing the file. Then, like the wonderful man he was, Michael had calmly started the search with her again, going through everything like they had all the time in the world to find the file. It had stilled her nerves, and she had been able to focus. Anne was certain she would lost her job and that he would fire her, but she was determined to finish the day and find that file. A complete search of the office had determined that the file was not there. Michael sat her down, gave her a glass of water, and gently coached her through what she had done that day. Finally, they realized that the document was probably in the shredding room, waiting or already shredded. There was no copy. Anne had felt close to tears over her mistake. She'd picked up the pile of files to go there, and had probably scooped it up with the ones that were to be destroyed. Michael had simply listened. He told her that it was going to be okay. They went to the copy room and found the file in a pile waiting to be destroyed. The meeting had already started. He'd taken the time to escort her back to the office and gave her a couple of memos to type. When she asked him if she was fired, he'd said of course not. She knew to double-check her work now. He'd invested far too much time and training into her to have her leave. Then he'd gone on to his meeting. They'd never discussed what had happened that day ever again. Reading Michael's version fit with hers, only it showed his surprise that she thought she should be fired. It told how she reminded him of Max once in a while, young and impetuous, how she was improving as a secretary, also how he thought her skirt was a little short. The men in the copy room had been looking at her legs. Her appearance reflected on him, 
while he thought her legs were long and lovely, he simply must put an end to this. Anne smiled. He liked her legs. She thought back and recalled that was the week he had talked to her about the harassment policy and dress code. She'd been mortified then. Now she was thankful. He had kindly reminded her what she was striving to be, a professional secretary, which involved keeping up appearances. Thanks to the journal, she now knew he liked her legs. Well, they weren't at work any more. Maybe she should keep wearing shorts. She wondered if she had packed her short shorts. She'd kept up at the gym and was still slim and leggy. If he admired legs, maybe he would get a view. She put the journal back and selected one, checking the dates. It was perhaps five years old. She settled down and read about his reaction to her dating Roy. He listed Roy's occupation, yearly earnings, and that he used improper tax reporting. Height, weight, age, it was all there. Anne sat up straight. It was worse than an employee file. It was also illegal. What had Michael been thinking? He'd investigated her boyfriend. He went on to document dates that they went on. It was all there between work-related items that he'd written down. Then, right in plain sight, he'd written, What kind of name is Roy? It's a stupid name. Leroy. It sounds like something someone would name their bloodhound. She can't possibly be serious dating him. He cheats on his taxes. Anne stared at the words. He'd never said anything against Roy. He'd never commented on anyone she had dated. It was the reason she felt he had absolutely no romantic feelings towards her. She was shocked that he disliked Roy so much. She'd dated him for nearly a year before finally breaking it off because he just wasn't Michael. Anne flipped a few more years and found a poem. It was beautiful. It described a woman who sounded like perfection itself. It was romantic. Michael was in love. She swallowed thickly. Michael was in love with the beautiful, perfect, mysterious woman with her silky hair, perfect curves, and seductive smile. Suddenly, she felt like the bottom had dropped out of her world. She'd known that Michael was in love with her, but had always assumed the possibility, the hope that he might come to do so existed. She'd never thought for an instant that he was in love with someone else. Anne shut the journal. She didn't want to know any more. Something had changed while he was sleeping. Anne was still hovering, keeping him company, being solicitous, but she seemed sad and depressed. He was sad and depressed. Still, she hadn't been earlier. Concerned, yes, not looking like someone had taken away her favorite toy. Now he was worried about her. He let her choose the movie. He let her choose the snack. He got up to refill her drink. Finally, he paused the movie and turned to look at her. She wasn't paying attention to the movie anyways. He instinctively knew it. Now she looked at him and he wondered what he could do to fix whatever was upsetting her. Michael reached out a finger and gently traced the frown lines between her eyebrows. She sighed. So he took her in his arms and just held her. If she wasn't going to talk, then he didn't know what he could do. She leaned on him. Michael waited patiently and was finally rewarded. I just realized today that I have loved someone for a very long time, but he will never love me back. She sniffled and wiped her eyes. I am so stupid. Michael's brow furrowed as he thought. Anne loved someone? He didn't like the idea at all. Then he suddenly knew who it was. Max. They'd each gotten an invite to the wedding today. Max and Anne were nearly the same age. When Max had worked for Ramsey Pharmaceuticals, Michael had seen him flirt with Anne. Truth be told, Max had flirted with every female back then. What if Anne had let herself fall in love with him? The thought made him sick. His Anne, in love with his youngest brother who was shortly getting married. Michael just held her. He didn't know what else to do. Anne fell asleep, so he gently settled them both on the couch, pulling a throw over her. He kept holding her, wishing impossible things. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please like this video. 
This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.